So, um, John, can you just start by telling us who you are and where we are? I'm John Probert, and I've lived in Western Beggard all my life. And I've been growing hops all, all my life, ever since I left school at 15. And grew, grew, grew them, obviously, with my father. And now we've gone on a generation, and I'm, I'm fading away now, and Tom is taking over. So, can you sort of tell us about um, your childhood, where you were born, and then when you moved to this farm, just sort of trace back to how you got to where you are now? I was born up on the, what we call the Worcester Road at Pearlbrook Farm, where my cousin is now. And at the age of four, I moved down to where we are now, Church Farm, because father wanted to do hop growing, and his two younger brothers who were farming here at Church Farm were, um, weren't making a very good job of it. And father said to the agent, would you like to swap over? And he agreed. Whether that's a good thing for me or not, or not, I'm because my cousin has a good lifestyle without hop growing. <laughs> so tell us about um, about how you about what you remember from when you were a very small child in hop picking times. What do you remember from that? I've still got vivid memories of the the bus loads that used to come from Dudley up in the Black Country. And there were people from Nantiglow, which is one of the Welsh Valley mining towns. And we also had gypsies, so we had a good mix of people who got on quite well until the <coughs> Saturday night came and they all piled into the new inn up at the, on the main road. And various fights broke out, I can remember being told about. And it was interesting times because of how many people were here. You know, it's tremendous difference now with the machine. And um, they used to pick into what we call cribs, which was a, a wooden thing with a cloth hanging in it. And they used to pick the hops in there. And then a man used to come along, uh, two or three people, and bushel the hops, and a bushel was how they were paid. And now I can remember it was 11 pence halfpenny. And each year they'd go on strike after the first day, and it was below my bedroom window where the negotiating was done at the back door up at the old vicarage where father lived. And he said, I'll give you a shilling a bushel but you can have a different bushler, because father used to do the bushling, and then um, they wouldn't have that. So he, he usually won the day that they stopped on 11 pence halfpenny. Well, you were talking about your father and they wanted a different bushler. Tell us a bit about that, because you used a really good phrase before. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, the most bushlers used to dip into the hops into the crib, and upright their bushel, and sort of they could see how exactly how much father used to straight into the hops and straight into the sack without upright upright in the bushel, and and they could see a fair way down the bushel because it wasn't upright, and and they thought they were getting a good deal, for, which they were probably, but to be fair, so why and then then these hops were put in from the bushel into a great big sack and eight bushels made a sack full. And then the sack was tied and taken, carried out onto the headland, put onto a, what we call trailer, ready to go into the kills to be dried. So why didn't, why, why didn't they want a different bushler to your father? Why didn't they? They, they didn't want a different bushler, did they? Why didn't no, they? no, because of how he never used to tip the bushel up, because some of the bushlers would tip it, put it upright, and then push, push their hand onto the hops to press them in into the bushel a bit more. <laughs> there was always this dispute on bushling. 
So why, what, um, tell us a bit about what people used to do then in their kind of downtime. You said they would put, go up to the pub and drink and stuff. What would, what would people have been... What would what? What, what would be? people have been doing when they weren't working in the... They would use the the women would usually be cooking on open cookers, and uh, they were called devils. These these big things full full of coke, and that was quite a thing. All all the cooking and washing and yeah, camaraderie. So, um, can you just talk to us a bit about the numbers of people that used to come and and how that changed then when you got. When it went a bit more mechanised, it was a very much uh, labour intensive. There would be on a small farm like this, there would be a couple of hundred people in round figures. It would be usually the lady and the, and the children. The men would be still at work, and they'd come down at weekends, mostly, except the gypsies. They were here. On, on site, like with their caravans. Yeah, Jerry Meyer Smith is the name that I can remember as, a, as the head man on the gypsy, and what he said went <laughs> as law. Aye. And was there much kind of mingling between people from, the, from Wales and the gypsies and the Dutch? Yeah, they, they weren't too bad, but they, did, they kept themselves to the South gypsies, yeah. Hi. So um, tell us then a little bit about the changes then when it went, what, from what you remember. Can you, you tell us about when your father got the first brush machine in and the changes then? Luckily, when I left school, age 15 or 16, uh, father bought the brush hopping machine. So, because I could see myself in the bushler, you see. <laughs> And um, so there was a vast change in the way we did hop picking. It became mechanised overnight having a hop picking machine. You went from 200 people down to about 20. And it, he was one of the first people in the 1955 to have a hop picking machine. Because the Bruff works over at Suckley were flat out from the early 50s till the mid 70s making hot picking machines. We used to have quite a few visitors come to look when we, the first couple of years, people who hadn't bought one, just running an eye over it. So what was your, why, why, what was your father's decision to buy the machine and move from the hand picking, was it purely? Well, it, there's a, it sounds like a lot of romance about this hand picking, but the reality is that it was a lot of hard work. So it was a good move. Yeah. It's the same as the romance of watching a thrashing machine. It was on Country File a couple of weeks ago at uh, Blenheim. They had a country fair and they had a thrashing box there and a baler and it all looks very romantic on film. But you work in all that dust and muck and it's not quite so romantic. <laughs> And the uh, hops is very similar job, like except you didn't have dust. So tell us a bit about why um, just compare sort of hop hop harvesting to other crops. Tell us why it's so labour intensive, because that's an interesting thing. Because I hadn't realised that you know why you need so many people compared to potato picking or whatever. Can you just tell us a bit? On the harvest side or growing right through. Well, the I suppose season. it's just the, why you needed so many people with the hand picking when you wouldn't have done for other crops. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, well, when you think, uh, if you have a look at a bind of hops, all those hops have got to be picked individually into the crib. And a good hop picker would only do eight bushels a day, which is the machine will do that in a minute. That's the sort of comparison. So, and then um, hop drying is another big thing. Kilns are everywhere in Herefordshire and the southeast, and 
they were cone-shaped to try and get draft to up through them to dry them be before the days of fans and things. Yeah. And um, hops go into a kill roughly 80% moisture and they've got to be dried down to roughly 10%. So there's a lot of water to come off in the drying process, which takes about 10 hours per kill. So that's a very fuel intensive job again. And you've got to get it just right. If you go above 10%, it, say you went to 11 or 12, they'll go moldy in, in what we call the bales now. And, they, and they're useless then. Well, I used to call it my museum because it was that ancient. There was a lot of history in those kills going back three or 400 years. And they worked perfectly all right. But unfortunately, two years ago, at half past two in the morning, everything went up in flames. And, the, and because it was so tinder dry on wood everywhere, it was all burnt out within an hour for one of the hop heaters playing up, either a big spark or whatever. But What did you do about your harvest? Luckily we hunted round and I got on well with uh, Charles Pudge at the bottom of Bishop's Room, which is next to the hop pocket, which is quite well known. And Charles is the first farm this side and his, his kills were redundant and he couldn't have been more helpful. So he took the, went back to the sack, sacks again and took them on our grain trailers down there and used his kills. So else we'd have been in the, oh, don't swear, right. <laughs> we could have been in a mess, <laughs> but he couldn't have been more helpful. So we only lost that day's pick in the fire and the insurance covers that so so what did you have to do after that then you had to build some new kilns yeah we got a brand new setup and uh, at the moment it seems to be working working well the hop machine used to be up at this end and tom moved that last last summer uh, split it into three and it was quite an operation to take it down the road and my wife said crikey all that work and nobody filmed it he was <laughs> he made a an axle for the one end to go on and a man or two at the other end and he was weaving it down the road <laughs> it's quite a big chunk of machine a third of it is like a, and he did well and he got it bolted all up together and of course, all the old bruff men were dead or past it. So he got nobody to help him who, who would have known how to put a machine together. So he did well on that front. And it seems to be working well at the moment. So just to frame it then, so when you, as hand pickers, there'd have been 200 people coming from outside, from Dudley, from... Yep. From Wales, you know, the gypsy yeah. people, then it went down to 20 people. Where would those 20 people have come from? And then when did it progress you, on to sort of we, European labour? I used to go down to a old mining town called Gethigare in mid Wales, and you'd get a gang from there. And if you could get them up here, once they were up here, you, you'd, you know, they'd stop sort of thing. But they weren't as reliable as you'd like, you know. It was hard work employing that sort of labour. Yeah. So how did it... How so did it we've happen? evolved now with the rest of the agricultural community in having, the, the foreign, having foreign labour. We've got a Polish lad He's been coming 10 years now. He's a farmer's son from Poland on a small farm. And he takes 
of picking time off and he'll come a week before and he'll stop a week after helping and he brings his friends and relatives and that's how our staff is. And it works. Yeah, work, because he's a damn good foreman as well and he, he can, one or two of them can't speak English and he can tell them in Polish, you know, what to be, what they should be doing. And it works well. You've got a few, you've got um, Martin and a couple of the others. Martin has been coming on and off for 40, 50 years. He came here as a student. He's from by Cardigan. And he's one of these unique people who, who thinks it's a privilege to be asked to come hop again. Thank you very much for asking me. <laughs> I love to get my feet on the hop ground. <laughs> oh, it's quite, quite funny. We call him the gentle giant because he's six foot odd and all muscle. You wouldn't want to fall out with Martin. And we've also got our, the, the two men hanging binds on today are the two two men who do the stringing in the hop yard in the spring, in March and April, where we use four tonne of coconut, wound coconut from Ceylon, Sri Lanka, <laughs> and we use four tonne of that every year. Yeah, it's wound into balls a bit bigger than a football like. Can you um, explain to me, you were talking this morning about how the hop grows because I found that really interesting that it's not just one which kind of comes out in loads and you have to train it up and how, how many make a vine and all of that. The hop is known as what a perennial so it's sitting there all the time and it goes dormant in the winter and then come the end of March, April it decides with the daylight hours and the warmer temperatures it decides to grow and there be as many as 50 shoots on one root and there's four strings to each root and each string you put two or three of these we call them wires binds up each and that is very labor intensive but we're lucky with those two boys who are hanging on and their families and they do it all they don't mind working on weekends which is a big bonus because the hop, once it starts to grow, it doesn't wait for anybody. <laughs> It'll grow from nothing to 15 foot in a couple of months. So a bind is actually two or three. And it'll only go clockwise, whereas a kidney bean will only go anti-clockwise. Uh, happens if you make it go the other way it won't it won't <laughs> that's great it'll try and unfold and go the right way <laughs> on it. so tell me a little bit about then about Tom and when he started kind of getting more involved with the farm and because you said there was a bit of a moment where you were saying to him come on fella make your mind up what you're doing <laughs> was, it a, was it as polite as that <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell it like it is, John. Don't you worry, mate. <laughs> no, Tom was, was undecided on the hop job, and and I said to him once or twice, I said, make up your bloody mind one way or the other. We can get him out or whatever. Anyway, he's converted to hops now, and he's really keen on the job. Because it's no good being 90% keen on hop growing. You've got to be 100% because every year is different growing. All these little things that come in because they're prone to what we call powdery mildew, downy mildew. Um, the hop dams and aphid flies in every year at the end of May and will breed by the million. This year it <laughs> did breed by the million, so you've got to spray for that, spray for the mildews. So spraying is at least once a fortnight or once a week if it gets desperate on anything. Spider is another thing, the red spider, the spider mite. Hmm. 
Tom was he was lucky enough to go to New Zealand and, and he was out working on a hop farm in the hop harvest for two years running. They invited him back for a second year and out there they don't get any mildews or de and very little disease. Must be isolated, New Zealand. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Tell us about what happened when he, how did he get the job on the hop farm? If you're from a farming background, travelling around New Zealand, he soon acquired himself a small motorbike and you can drop in on any farm, more or less, and, and, and they'll find you a job if, you, if you're willing to do whatever. And he, was, he said he was driving a, what we call worn out combine and forever repairing it. And then he, on his travels, it was just the hop harvest season and he dropped in on this hop farm and the machine was the same, basically the same as ours, a bruff, but it was on stop. And he said they didn't seem to have much idea of how to repair it. So he said to the boss man, do you want a hand repairing it? And he obviously said, yes, if you know know about this. and. He helped them repair it and, and the boss bloke said, you want a job for two or three weeks? And he says, yeah, I don't mind. And he said, well, you can look after this bloody thing, <laughs> which he did. And it, it just worked out really tidy. Have you got any, have you got sort of a, uh, any sort of mem particular sort of story or memory that you really associate with hop picking any kind of? You're putting me on the spot, you. I am a bit, aren't I? <laughs> you, sh you should have warned me about story. a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> What's your kind of, you know, have you got a little pub story that you always tell people? Oh, I remember the time when blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. <laughs> you're sure still, you you're still putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> you got to think, is it a clean, has it got a clean ending to it? No, it's just that it's inbred to you to grow hops, perhaps, and I wouldn't know how, how to do anything else. I've done it all my life. And, and the beauty of a hop crop is you can keep learning something every year different. Anybody who says they know it all knows nothing, in, in my opinion. So. That's nice. That's nice. Mm. So why do you... Um, just this is more a question for us really just to finish off um we're kind of going around c talking to people like you filming the hop harvest and collecting yeah. stories and showing people all, all these old photographs and things what do you think there's a value in that why do you think it might do you think it's an important thing to do or what keep photographs well no to kind of <laughs> collect the stories and the memories oh yeah people yeah to share it them. is it is, like we said earlier, it is a different crop to anything else. Hop, hop seems to have this romance about it. And there's only 50 odd left in the country, about 25 up in the West Midlands and 25 in the South East. Whereas when I left school, there'd be a thousand hop growers. And they were wiped out mainly through a deadly fungal disease called verticillium wilt. You quite often see a big notice on gateways, do not enter verticillium wilt. And that came up into Herbiger in the 70s. It had lurked about in Kent in the earlier than that. And they also had an outbreak at the experimental farm at Rosemond and they completely exterminated the hop yard, took the lot down and laid it down to grass and cured it that way. We still got a bit of wilt and we use a rotation system when it gets that bad. We'll take the lot out and, and grass the patch down for two or three years and grass will get rid of wilt more or less. And there are varieties that are or put up with wilt better than some others. 
So, John, tell us a bit about um, how kind of the marketing and how you sell on the hops and everything. Then you were saying about somebody's coming tonight and there's like yep. the, the agents. How does all that work? We have a what we call a hop agent who is our go-between between between us and the hop merchants who we sell to. And um, everything up to us, about 80, 90% is forward sold. We've sold our hops now, a lot of them up 2020. And and that gives you confidence to grow them for in case there's a collapse in the market line. Because the Americans in their wisdom <clears throat> because there was a good uh, spot, what we call spot market last year, that surplus hops were selling at a premium, high, higher than your forward contracted hops. They, in their wisdom, go and slap about 4,000 acres in, which is a, more than our uh, acreage in this country altogether. And I haven't got the courage to g tell them at the World Hop Conference I do wish you Americans would do your arithmetic and not be so greedy that if you're on a level playing field, you will have a level price. Whereas putting 4,000 acres in, it distorts the, the market a bit. Why is that? Why is it? Because they... Well, they oversupply. Simple as that. So that brings the price down. And that bring as soon as you're on oversupply, they can tell you, well, we'll pay you so much. That's why we do forward contracting, because it's such an expensive crop to grow, and you can't afford to make any mistakes, so you can't afford to make any mistakes on your marketing. And Alan, who is coming up tonight, he's been in the hop job all his life as a hop agent. They used to be called hop factors, don't know why. And they were the go-between for us and the, the merchants. And the merchants are the people who supply the breweries. And there's two, three big merchants, Farrams, who are local at Malvern, Steiners, who are based in Essex, who are worldwide. They've got a huge hop farm in America, Steiners. Huh? And there's also Loup Refesh. And he's based in Yaldin in Kent. Oh, saved by the bell.